Show's Inner Child Podcast. So, Robert, we were talking about the limitations financially of indie films. I'm curious if there's anything specifically that had to be written out or changed um, from the script based on not being able to do it, uh, whether it just wouldn't work logistically film-wise or specifically budget-wise. Not really budget-wise, because Susie was quite careful to... um, keep it within the realm that we could afford, which was, you know, a single location for uh, most of the film and honestly like three characters. So that was quite manageable. Um, anything? No, I, I'd say there was a couple scenes in the bedroom that I moved. This is going to sound weird that I moved to the bathtub <laughs> because <laughs> the character had already done a similar thing in her bed. And I just thought she's going to jump in the bath anyways. Why don't we do it there? No, no, no. Um, very tasteful, but, um, other than that, not really. Um, I, would like to think I helped direct it towards, uh, oh, Susie, I don't think we have the budget to do this or that, but maybe not. Like it just came out. Um, I do have, Colin and I both have a pretty good grasp on reading something and, uh, liking the idea, but also your inner voice cautioning, oh, that could be really tough to pull off just because we've done it before. And when, you know, when someone says, um, it's like, you know, I'm teaching a course this weekend. And one of the things I say is don't make your short film. It's just going to be like the matrix. No, no, don't do it. Cause you're going to look like a dumbass because you don't have the resources, you know, start small, uh, master that before you get bigger. And sometimes on a smaller budget, if you try something that's too big, it's great because you're hitting for the stars, but it can sometimes also backfire. So I am cognizant of that. Like if there's a crowd scene, um, someone writes a crowd scene, my first thought is fear. Where do we get a crowd? Like my movie before this was Chokeslam, it was a wrestling comedy. And uh, what do you do at four in the morning when you're shooting and you need a crowd and there's 13 people there? You know, like that, uh, like right now, I think I'm going to have a stroke just thinking about that. Curious about that. I do want to point out, Robert, I had a giant robotic spider in Bright Hill Road and you cut that. Oh, I must have missed that. Did you forget that? Because I really, I was really upset about that. It was stop motion animation. I would have <laughs> but CG, no, so, no. No, no CG. Man, can you tell us about the giant robotic spider scene? <laughs> I'm interested. I'm still writing it. <laughs> nice. So um, maybe, maybe in, uh, we'll see you in Romy. Uh, <laughs> was there anything that people don't ask you guys? Um, or anything specifically about this film that you guys would like uh, this uh, time as a platform to express to listeners or people who haven't seen the trailer? Go ahead, Susie. I was just going to say our cast was spectacular. Like uh, Siobhan Williams, who plays Marcy, the protagonist, she was extraordinary. They all were. Agam Darshi plays Mrs. Inman, and the inimitable uh, Michael Eklund plays Owen. And they they all were. And, and as um, a writer who is really very still very very new to this process, watching those guys take those words that you know flat page and putting it turning it into something flash was extraordinary but they we really really lucked into this fantastic cast yeah i would concur it's siobhan's movie uh joe i hope you get to see it because she just kills um for me i i had some fear that because this is not um a slasher or uh, a super fast-paced mission impossible kind of horror that world war z or z or uh, I don't know. I, I just thought, oh, are people going to be into this? Because I love this sort of thing, like Session Nine, if anyone's seen it. I adore that film. It's just so thick with atmosphere and um, cinematic density. And yes, I just made that up now, but it's true. Um, so there was some emulation there, uh, certainly with the score and the atmospherics. Um, but it's not wham, bam, thank you, Van Damme. It takes its time in slowly building apprehension and dread and I, I love that and I guess my the realization the answer to your question is that there's enough horror fans like me that love that sort of stuff that I'm very grateful that it's so much more than 
Uh, if it's not Friday the 13th, I'm, I'm out. You know what I mean? Um, I'm so yeah. glad that there's an audience that likes different subgenres of horror as well. Uh, Callan, is there anything that you'd like to say about the film? Um, well, I definitely concur about um, the cast and, you know, the, the reception to the film. Um, and I, I guess it just, to me, it, to any filmmakers out there, how important it is to build a team. Um, because, I mean, we had a small group of us, but each of us knew what we were doing. And, and, um, and that makes all the difference. And so we've started to work more together on doing other projects. And so it's like shorts and and other things just to to keep building that team and i think that's such an important key to to successful indie filmmaking now mm -hmm. obviously it's a very collaborative process um and even though you guys had a small uh, a smaller team and you were taking on more roles um with it being a collaborative process you know we've named actors and stuff but is there anybody that uh, specifically worked behind the scenes that you'd like to highlight or mention um you know, while we have this chance, even though we're not going to be speaking to them, anybody uh, that contributed a lot and kind of helped bring it all together? I have two. One is the cinematographer who's been a friend of mine. We shot our first thing together in, ready for this, 89. And this is the first movie we shot. Yes, I'm, I'm very old. I was one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you saw it then. And, um, um, but the benefit there is we have a shorthand and I can communicate to him. Like he knows what I want instantaneously fast. The second is a dude named Frank Lorada, who is our sound designer who I've worked with before, but it's the first time where I realized that sound matters more in horror than any other genre. And the subtleties and all the intricate things he did uh, won't go unnoticed. Like they, I don't know if this is gonna play in theaters other than uh, on festival runs, but if you've got five, Five one at your house, you're just going to notice so much sumptuous detail that he put into there. And of course, sounds always important, but I swear in horror, it's even more important. So those two people really elevated this. That's awesome. Um, did you guys have anything to add to that, Colin and Susie? Yeah, I'd also, uh, my brother, Carl, um, he helped me with uh, the producing as well as doing all the production design. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just phenomenal. I mean, the, the hotel we shot in was built in 1910 or something like that. Um, so it had a lot of character itself, but, uh, but Carl was really able to, um, to really build into that and to, to make it more than, than what was there. Nice. I would echo Carl, uh, Carl as well. Um, that is who I was going to say. And because he uh, he also did like the 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 intricate details of the production design that he did, you know, he did front pages of newspapers and clippings of things. And I'd also like to point out that Lisa Cuffley and Robert and Tanya um, also did a ton of the the artwork that appears in the film, and um, also the uh, I forget what they're called B-roll cutaway stuff. It's fantastic. <laughs> Joe's Inner Child Podcast.